Hey everyone. Hi, David. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Rural Vision. I think for the second or third time, I don't remember. It's definitely the second time I'm interviewing someone from Nickel, a crypto investment management firm based in London. Um, I think I interviewed and spoke with Natalie probably more than a year ago. But before we get going, my name is Marit Siebert. I'm the CIO of Exponential Age Investment Management, a crypto investment management firm just like yourselves, maybe with a different angle. Um, and before we get going, David, give us a little bit of a background um, about yourself. You know, what do you do at Nickel? What fund do you run? How did you get there? Just, you know, uh, educate the audience um, as to what it is that you do. Yeah, with pleasure. And thank you very much for having me. Um, th this should be fun. I, my name is David Fauchier. I'm a PM at Nickel. Uh, Nickel Digital is a London-based uh, crypto-focused asset management firm um, regulated here by the FCA. And we've run a number of different products, um, one of which is a multi-manager, multi-strategy fund, um, which I'm the PM of called Diversified Alpha. And previous to this, I ran a fund of funds in the crypto space um, and, and have been in crypto for, for quite a while now. Well, what does for, for quite a while mean? I mean, when did you, uh, like 2009, 2010, like the Genesis block type of uh, time frame, or when, when did you get down? 2008, like everybody else. <laughs> uh, First, first started looking at researching and like, you know, buying your first Bitcoin and all of this in 20, late 2012. So it's going to be a decade. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's 2013 for me. Time flies. I, you know, I was joking. Yesterday I gave a presentation here in Munich. People were asking me, when did you get involved in cryptos? And I was like, wait, 2013, I, you know, I bought the first Bitcoins because you could, you could really easily afford multiple coins yeah. back then. Uh, but that doesn't really mean a lot because, you know, as soon as the thing made, you know, 2x, 3x, 4x, uh, you know, you feel like a rock star and you kind of like you have to get out of the thing and realize the games. <laughs> now, with the benefit of hindsight, you know, it's, you know, you would have done it differently. But anyway, hey, let's speak about uh, Nickel. Let's speak about your fund. Um, I'm running this series on, you know, interviewing some of the most exciting crypto hedge fund managers in the world. So I rank you among them. And we'd like to understand a little bit better about you know, the way you trade, the way you view the market, uh, how you select managers, how you select trading strategies. But before we like go into all the details, maybe you uh, let us know again, the, the name of the fund that you run, the objective of the fund, uh, since when it exists, just the basics. Sure. So we're a little bit limited on, on what we can say publicly, but um, as you'll see from the website, the fund is called Diversified Alpha. It's a multi-strategy, multi-manager fund, um, which is a mouthful but that really means we are running multiple different strategies and we do that by allocating to uh, external or internal managers who each run a piece of the book as a managed account for us. And what we're trying to do as a whole with the portfolio is to achieve non-directional, uncorrelated returns uh, to, the bit, to the crypto markets in general. Am I correct in saying that it's probably like an LP type of structure, so it's a pooled structure, but inside that pooled structure, you have a bunch of managed accounts to which that fund points? Exactly. And it's a little bit different to how an SMA would work in the traditional space, but it's sort of the crypto equivalent of a, a managed account um, where all of the funds are inside uh, the fund's control. So they're inside our control, even though they're managed by external managers. And those funds actually sit with the custodian as well. Yeah. Just so uh, people know, SMA means single managed account. I think that is that is what you mean. Uh, it is it is something that you know in the future space CTA space it's uh, it, it you know it's quite a usual thing to trade that way, um, and obviously you can do it in 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 the crypto markets as well. So diversified alpha, I mean, just you know when you say you combine a bunch of managed accounts, and I think you've managed there. Some of them are internal, and some of them are external. Um, is it fair to say, and, and you, you can say say no to that, is it fair to say that that is like a pop type of infrastructure that's run inside of Nickel where you have complete oversight of the risk and you see everything because it runs on your technology and on your infrastructure, your account and portfolio management systems? Or is it more a setup where, say, a trader, an independent trader that has a great trading strategy could be sitting somewhere in the world, Australia, for instance, far away from London, trade from there um maybe off of your infrastructure on his or her own infrastructure and you would just be monitoring the risk and the returns so it's uh, a little bit of both but at the moment more of the latter in what you're describing so we 
philosophically, what we're trying to achieve here is to be a great home for the world's best crypto traders. So our job is really to go out and find what we consider to be the very best trading teams across the crypto space. Many of these tend to be prop shops um, that are running their own money and do not have a fund. Um, but it could be a trader off the street or someone who left one of the brand name prop shop funds who's looking for a seat somewhere where they can just sit down and start trading. And so in that scenario, they would be trading using our infrastructure. And in the first scenario with the kind of the prop shop model, they're their own boss, um, they're independent. They just happen to run a managed account for us. But the way in which they're doing that is we will, we have accounts set up at all of the major exchanges. And once we've gone through the due diligence process with the manager and we like the manager, they tell us where they want to trade and we'll set up sub accounts for them across these different exchanges and give them access to the sub account. And they'll have trading permissions for that sub account, but what they can't do is take the capital out. What this allows us to do is also to plug into those same sub accounts with our own APIs and connect that back to our proprietary risk systems. And from those, we're able to see for each manager and their trading, everything that they're doing in real time and therefore monitor the risk in real time across PL, exposures, um, correlations, whatever we would like to kind of compute because we're seeing all of the positions we can. That's clever. Yeah, th there's kind of a two part benefit to that. The first is from the risk side. Um, style drift is a real risk. Um, and when you invest into a fund, you're investing somewhat blindly. Um, you don't really know what's going on month to month inside the fund. Whereas here, if they start stepping out of line, trading a new instrument, um, doing something that they're not supposed to, we'll, we can pick that up immediately. Um, and so from the risk perspective, if there's a risk breach, a style drift, something like that, um, we can pick up on it. We can cut the manager. We can take the accounts over. And then from a what I kind of think of as a right tail perspective, being able to see the managers trading in real time, I think allows us to have much deeper and richer conversations with those managers as we continue that due diligence process post the first investment with them because we can see and understand what they're doing much better and get more comfortable with it. And I think it, it basically makes for a more kind of interesting manager conversation than a more kind of one-way conversation if we were invested in the fund and we're asking them to report back to us what they did and how it went. So I assume that sub account could be in sub account with a centralized exchange such as FTX or Binance exactly. or you know yeah. whatever these type of, and then that account is kind of like a custody account that becomes part of the pool, the LP structure, and therefore it becomes a part of the the fund that you run and it's integrated that way. But because you can kind of like API and plug into the account and see everything that goes on in real time, they can take the money out. You have a more granular view on the risk. Uh, you can challenge the manager, but you can also be helpful to the manager in terms of, hey, there's you know something that has been you know changing or, or drifting, shifting. Um, we don't want that, you know, go back to where you came from, something like that. You know, what's the question I wanted to ask is, you know, these prop shops. I mean, when you when you think about traditional, you know, capital markets and trade successful proprietary traders, if they run prop and if they have fantastic risk adjusted returns they tend to make a habit of flying under the radar because mm -hmm. they want to keep their cookie for themselves, for themselves, right? Um, and, and not really share it with anyone. So how do you go about, you know, how do you sniff them out? How do you be the detective of the market and, you know, find out where those gems are, those great crypto traders, find them um, and then convince them to get onto your platform and, you know, share some of that great trading strategy with you? So... That's part of, I guess, the art and the fun of it as well. Um, I, I actually think our, my, my job here is quite similar to what a venture capitalist job is. Like in both cases, you're trying to find exceptional teams doing something um, important and good, and then you're trying to give them money. Um, and in both those cases, they typically don't need your money um, on the venture side because they've got offers from everybody else. And on, on our side, because they're probably independently wealthy already and, you know, making good money on, on their own money um, and don't need to run outside money. Um, there's no kind of magic bullet. Unlike the traditional space, you can't go to see a PB or a cap intro team and say, hey, you know, just give me, you know, a big CSV of all of the different crypto funds and all of the stats. Like we don't have databases 
there are some databases in the crypto space, but they don't, I've never found a good one. Um, and the best traders typically aren't on them, as, as you say. So it's a mix of different things. Like I've been allocating capital pretty much continuously now for four years, a bit longer, um, to specifically market neutral teams in the crypto space. And when I started, there were maybe 20 teams. Today, it's in the hundreds, call it maybe 500. Um, and that means that the crypto space kind of started out tiny and very much as a cottage industry. And today is still very small compared to traditional standards. So a lot of managers know each other. And if you have been a good capital partner to someone in the past, we found you know a lot of the best intros that we've had to managers have come from people that we've given capital to now or have given capital to in the past who've recommended us to somebody else. So being in the space for a long time and, and being known as a provider of capital who understands what these traders are doing certainly helps. And a lot of what we do day to day is really to try and build that momentum and compound that reputation um, for ourselves so that more and more of the um, flow that we're getting is inbound rather than us reaching out cold um, to traders. The second is, um, again, kind of there's no magic bullet, but we do events, we do podcasts like this, and this is kind of my opportunity to um, hopefully, you know, have this heard by prop shops um, somewhere that we haven't spoken to um, who might have more capacity than they have capital um, and who are looking to run an SMA for someone who can write them a check in size, understands what they're doing and can provide the connectivity that they need in order to pull that off. And we're a little bit, I think, uh, unique in the size that we have and the niche that we are focused on because the, I think there are very few people who are writing check size, checks kind of at the same size as we are for people where they can provide a manager with market making fee tiers across multiple exchanges, for example. So we trade on the 10 largest exchanges more or less and we are designated market makers on most of those. And so what we often find is we'll talk to a prop shop that's very good, but is running single digit millions. Um, and they're turning that capital over, I don't know, a hundred times a month, for example. And that means they're doing, you know, whatever it is, amount of volume per month on a given exchange because their capital will be split across multiple. But that's not sufficient for them to get to the top levels of the market making programs. And with those come preferential access to exchanges, things like co-location, um, better rebates from the exchange, cheaper taker rates, um, basically cheaper and better trading on the exchanges. And because we're aggregating the different managers through our fund into basically one counterparty facing the exchange, what we typically find is that we're able to provide better rates to the traders than they can get themselves. And if you can do that, it should improve their returns purely because the slippage on trading fees is lower. So everybody wins, we make more money and they make more money in performance fee. Um, but also it can open up entire trades that they're not able to do at their fee tiers that they can do on our fee tiers. And so sometimes they're running counterintuitively um, their best trades through us, but not their own accounts. Um, it doesn't happen all the time, but it has happened. And it's a very satisfying kind of part of the flywheel for us. Um, and then we can provide, you know, infrastructure and in, in other respects to them as well. Then net returns improve because you give them access, more efficient access to the markets. I mean, there were now, there were so many things in what you've just said. Actually, I'll, I'll you know, the co-location piece is kind of interesting when you think about, you know, how do you actually co-locate next to an AWS server, which, you know, maybe some of these exchanges run on. So it's kind of a different thing than, you know, being across the river in New Jersey and you know, plugging yeah. plugging into the NYSE trading infrastructure, but we can maybe we go there a little later because okay. that is sure. that is a technical topic that, that actually I, I find quite interesting. Coming back to the database, and you know, I think it's part of the value that you add as a fund manager is you know going out and finding these managers, you know, being there now for four years allocating capital, and it's kind of like word of mouth because, as you rightly say, the databases. I don't want to say that they are bad; they're simply incomplete because not everybody reports to them. In you know, traditional finance, you have this um, incentive for managers to immediately report to any type of database, to multiple databases at the same time. So it's kind of like relatively easy to get an 
you know, almost accurate picture of the, the lay of the land. But in crypto, depending on the database that you look at, I mean, you've just mentioned there's probably 500, maybe 600. I mean, we all have our estimates, but somewhere in that range, trading firms out there, some of them funds, some of them props, some of them run managed accounts. All of that is very top heavy and lopsided, you know, from, from you know, when I look at this is, okay, so 80% of the stuff is not in the database. Uh, or 70% of the stuff is not in the database. And then the things, the managers that I can see, um, there's kind of like, I don't know, two dozen, maybe three dozen that are really of size where it's kind of like, you know, they're institutionally set up and investable and they have the setup and the infrastructure. And the remaining ones are kind of like single digit trading shops um, with smaller type of teams, uh, one, two, three people, um, not necessarily in you know Mayfair with a with a with a posh office. It's kind of like you know they 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 need to. It, it's a different type of setup, which which comes and produces um, a different type of risk for you as a as a fund manager that's looking to allocate to these, right? Because you know how do they how do they actually manage their wallets? Is it you know do they do multi sig? Same thing. These are things. Let's go there in a sec, but the uh, in order to keep the sequence, you've mentioned, and I find that interesting, that you're specifically looking at market neutral fund managers, if I heard you correctly. Um, I'd like to know why. Um, what does market neutral mean to you? I mean, what type of strategies would you categorize under market neutral? And why would you not open that up um, to say, directional trading, so not market neutral, but, you know, going for the top side, going for the upside of the market, because looking at the historical rate of return, I mean, you know, that stuff makes 100% a year or more. Um, so why not, why not do the moonshot? Why, why do market neutral? Um, so tell me about that. I had a call with a trader uh, a couple of months ago that's really stuck in my mind because he was really honestly laughing kind of from the heart when I was explaining that we only did market neutral. And he was like, just let me get this straight. You're in this asset class that's going up, I think like a historical 90% a year, you're charging two and 20 or, you know, whatever fees you're charging and you have no beta and you're doing everything you can not to have beta in your portfolio. And I was like, yes. <laughs> he was yeah. just laughing and laughing, like saying, why? Um, there's, there's this extraordinary thing happening in crypto at the moment, which has always happened, um, which is that crypto funds remain an access product, I think. Um, crypto exposure is not very easy for everybody to get access to um, when you're starting to think about family offices less, but really institutions. Um, they need to invest in funds. And as a result, they people are willing to pay kind of two and 20 fee structures for access to an enormous amount of beta and volatility. And if you think about a performance fee, it's really like a call option um, where the more volatile the underlying strategy um, and the underlying market, typically, if, if you have directionality to your strategy, the more valuable that kind of 20% performance fee becomes. Um, so I think there's all sorts of kind of reasons from a short term kind of optimization of like firm revenues that we shouldn't be doing uh, things the way we're doing them. Um, the other side of the ledger for me is, I think it's more honest to charge, you know, a, a fee on alpha. Um, I think that it's easier to do that in a market neutral way than it is in a directional way. Um, I think crypto markets have certainly gone up a lot if we take a five year view, but you get years where nothing happens or the market drops and your AUM can collapse. Um, and, and when you make, you know, fantastic returns, sometimes it can be sort of less to do with you and more to do with the market. Um, I like market neutral because I find it more intellectually interesting. I think it's a higher value add kind of product back to investors. I think what we do is genuinely difficult to replicate um, and adds real alpha. And we're only kind of, skimming a performance fee on that alpha. So for a lot of kind of poly intellectual, poly philosophical reasons, I prefer it that way. Um, there are plenty of people that do directional products. We have some directional products here at Nickel um, with and without performance fees. Um, I just think a kind of non-directional multi-manager 
is is a really interesting product that didn't really exist in the market in the way that we've done it. And yeah, partly kind of wanted it for myself. I, yeah, I completely get it. I mean, obviously, you can also generate alpha in a directional type of trading strategy, you know, when you think about, you know, a universe of tokens or coins, and maybe do a relative momentum type of trading, uh, you outperform the market, but you are directional, that is a, you know, form of alpha there as well. Obviously, it's, it's very really rare for people to back out like a market index. When they're kind of exactly. And in, in, in your case, it crystallizes more clearly, um, because you tend to have long short positions or probably do market making or, you know, we speak about the strategies in a minute. Um, so it's more readily, readily visible as a genuine form of alpha on, on, on which you charge. The thing is, you know, the market and, and the interest I see from investors is now so broad in crypto because now the infrastructure does exist, right? We have tax guidance, we have regulatory guidance, we have essentially institutional create custody with firms such as, you know, copper or fireblocks. It's, you know, none of that stuff really existed four or five years ago, or to a much, much lesser degree in terms of, you know, um, um, setup and, and quality. So all of a sudden, because the environment has improved, and it allows institutional players to access the space, they look at different things, you know, some of them have an interest in market neutral, and they want to use it as a complement um, to the directional exposure, because they also believe in, you know, the asset class, um, or the digital asset space in, in, in general, uh, for that to go multiples higher over the next coming years. So they combine their own portfolio, which is which is something that we know from, you know, other type of traditional finance hedge fund type of trading strategies as well. It's, it's, it's happening in the same way, I think. Yeah, I think, I mean, my personal view is that there's broadly three different ways to invest in crypto. And I think all of them have merit. I think kind of the first and easiest one that usually gets people through the door is uh, basically long Bitcoin. And I think that view has validity to the extent that you believe there's a thesis around earning gold. I think there's a similar thesis around earning Bitcoin and you may or may not adhere to an inflation narrative or the money printing narrative. Um, but like, it's a reasonable, there's a reasonable investment case, I think, for Bitcoin um, that people can like or dislike. But if you like it, you should be really, I think, buying physical and ideally buying physical, or, you know, buying, buying and storing your own Bitcoin is what I mean by physical. Um, kind of, you know, your Bitcoin ledger should sit in your Swiss bank vault along with your gold bar as your kind of end of the world hedge. Um, I think that's kind of the pure expression of the Bitcoin thesis. Um, the next way is directional and saying, I don't know about Bitcoin, I have no view on macro, but I think this technology is interesting, here to stay, and probably going to create value. And so I'd like to get some kind of exposure to that. And I think the clearest expression of that is really a venture fund. So go out, find a venture manager who's a an expert in the space and give them capital or someone like um, your firm and, and what you guys are doing with Exponential Age, people who are professionals and can go and ferret out smart, directional kind of technology risk. And I think the third way is to say, I have no idea about this Bitcoin thesis. I have no macro views. I don't know about the tech either. This may be, you know, the next big thing. It may be nothing. But what I can see is that today there are inefficiencies in a liquid market that can be exploited for a return. And this is kind of the market neutral piece. And at a personal level, I've done all three. Um, for my family, I've done all three. As a firm, we have passive products. We have active products. We have pure beta, pure alpha, um, kind of a menu of different options that reflects that. And I think for a, an institution that's looking to get access to crypto, it makes sense to have a finger in multiple of these different pies. Yeah. Um, at a professional level, I just enjoy being on the market neutral side. I think it's more fun. Yeah, I'm sure it's super interesting. So let's speak about this. So market neutral. What do you, I mean, what's the taxonomy of market neutral? What to you is market neutral? Um, and, you know, what type of strategies do you run? So I use market neutral because it's just a simpler vernacular, but uh, technically what we're doing in our fund is more beta neutral than market neutral. Okay. By market neutral, I mean you are never taking any market risk. If you have $100 of Bitcoin long, you have $100 of Bitcoin short at all times except maybe a few milliseconds when you're legging into your trade. We do some market neutral. So this is really your kind of structural arbitrage strategies. 
There's your high frequency trading, your cross exchange arbitrage in spot markets and derivative markets, um, cash and carry, um, funding rate trades, calendar spreads, um, directionally trading the basis. So steepeners and flatteners using futures. Um, those kinds of trades I, I would consider to be strictly market neutral. And that is the majority of our portfolio. But we also do other trades, which I would consider technically to be beta neutral. Um, things like market making. So a market maker will have inventory and that inventory will oscillate around a kind of neutral point at which they're hedged. But at a given point in time, they might be long or short the market 5% as they provide liquidity on one side or the other of the market. Um, and what they're doing all day, a market maker is sort of like a pawn shop. Um, they you know, open the doors and they have inventory that's available for sale. And people can just walk through the door and they have the right, but not the obligation to buy or sell inventory to the pawn shop or to the market maker. Um, and so a market maker in crypto is really bidding and offering um, crypto on both sides of the order book and basically saying, I'm willing to buy at a discount or sell at a premium, any asset at any time, anywhere. And as this happens hundreds of thousands of times a day, they tend to average out. So somebody is always selling Bitcoin to them at a slight discount on exchange A, but somebody is buying Bitcoin at a slight premium from them on exchange B, and these two trades sort of net out. And so market making, I consider to not have much directional risk, but it's not technically market neutral. It's beta neutral, but over a period of a week or two weeks, um, if you average out the market exposure, it basically um, washes out to zero. Um, and market making is a you know, the structural ARB stuff is typically high sharp, but it has this PL profile where if the market's not moving and there are no dislocations, it doesn't make money. And if the market is moving and there are dislocations across assets, it's making money. And so you have this sort of staircase PL where you're either flat or up on a given day, um, which can be very attractive. But for the past few months, for example, things have picked up in the last couple of weeks, but December, January, February were very, very quiet months, and it can be quite frustrating to sit there patiently trying to, you know, not making money and trying not to make any mistakes. Market making is a little bit more of a kind of robust all weather strategy. Um, you can lose money, um, especially if there's a huge volatility event, but the PL sort of tends to tick up. Um, it tends to have a high sharp, um, a little bit lower sortino. Um, the returns tend to be good. And they tend to be quite durable across different market regimes and over time. Um, beyond that, we sort of go into the more volatile types of trading, um, but which can still be quite interesting to add in smaller size in the portfolio. Um, things like statistical arbitrage and relative value. And on relative value, for example, like I would not consider that to, we don't bucket that as market neutral, even though... In the traditional space, you probably would. In the tradi traditional space, you'll do a relative value strategy and you'll say, I'm long Coca-Cola, short Pepsi, and I'm betting on the spread between them to uh, move. But I'm neutral as to the equity market or, or the yeah. kind of soft drink factor in the market in equities. Um, in crypto, the correlations are much younger by necessity because these assets have not been around for a long time. And the distribution of those correlations are very non-stationary, which is that they move around a lot, and therefore you can't rely on them that much. And so we would consider like long Bitcoin, short Ethereum to be like a dirty hedge. It's technically market neutral in the equity sense of the word, but in terms of how we think about risk management, we just consider that to be, you know, twice the market risk. No, it's it's a spread trade. You're short Ethereum, you're long Bitcoin. Um, you know, even though the correlation between the two is is positive and significantly positive, it is a dynamic correlation, and that correlation may break. So you have no guarantee, and you shouldn't have that, you know, expectation that there's not going to be a break that's going to be possible. You know, that trade can actually go wrong on both legs, with Ethereum going higher and Bitcoin going lower. So that is that is. That is a different type of trading. Um, it's it's different type of trading than you know making markets or doing a cash and carry trade. Where you know even I mean, cash and carry trade, you're long a spot position, you're short a futures contract. Um, 
or the other way around if that's what you want to do but you know usually it's kind of like you're long the spot you short the futures contract um but you know you short something that is maybe expiring in a month time expiring in you know three months time so it comes with you know curve risk and repo risk and you know all these type of things it you know that that is what what's producing the pnl so but i i get that what's interesting to me is you know how do you look at you know putting that stuff together because um all of these types of strategies have their moment in the sun and then maybe they become a little bit more quiet and dormant you've mentioned you know the market making piece i probably i assume you know that will correlate or the the pnl that strategy will correlate with volume and retail activity and these type of things you know how often people will be are willing to kind of like cross bid offer and if there's just nothing happening in the market then that strategy is quiet We've seen something like that in, in cash and carry trading, which we've all done, and I've done it a year, year and a half ago. That was amazing. Implied yields were, you know, massively high. You kind of like you had to do that trade because it was staring in the face. I mean, it was, it was. But now, you know, the basis isn't that high anymore. Um, you know, it went negative, around zero, slightly positive. So, you know, you're not making as much money from. Um, cash and carry and basis trading as you used to a year, year and a half ago. So how do you go about putting that thing together? Do you have, like, do you recognize that and therefore go, okay, so basis trading isn't working as well as it used to. Therefore we do more in say pattern recognition instead of art because that now works better. Or do you follow more of an approach as they all work at their time. So let's have kind of like an equal allocation or maybe inverse vault weighted or whatever type of allocation methodology you use, but keep that thing static and just run it over time and wait for the thing to come back. So the approach that we've got is with this, with this product, what I, I love and kind of the reason why we crafted it the way we have is crypto markets move very quickly. Opportunities appear and disappear very quickly. Market regimes shift kind of quarter on quarter rather than over multiple years. And therefore we, we think that there's just a huge benefit to being able to be nimble. And this is part of the reason for the managed account structure and part of the reason for having this very broad remit. We can go and do, you know, everything in structural ops like HFT or cash and carry to your point. Like if we had a repetition of what was happening 12 months ago and you could do cash and carry unlevered without any counterparty risk because you're doing it using copper clear loop, for example, and you don't actually need to post collateral to the exchange and you can be making 30% plus annualized. That is a wonderful trade. You should of course be doing that in size and that should be 70, 80, hundred percent of your book. And we have the flexibility if that opportunity were to come up tomorrow to just zero out a bunch of other strategies and move everything into cash and carry if the opportunity is just so exceptional. It's unlikely we would do it. Um, firstly, it's probably not gonna go to that level again. We'll see. Um, we have like max position limits, counterparty limits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in kind of theory, we should be able to reallocate across the book according to where we think the best risk reward is. Now, generally, multiple things tend to be doing quite well at the same time. So you're gonna be splitting out between them. Um, some strategies, you know, start out relative value are more risky. You have to set your stops much more loosely. Um, they take more kind of net or gross exposure risk than other strategies might. And so you want to be sizing them much smaller. But in general, what we're trying to do is have a finger in every pie across all of the different ways of making money across this space with as many high quality managers as we can. And then within that kind of universe that we've constructed for ourselves, be able to shift our allocations at the margin around based on where the risk kind of most attractive risk rewards are. And so in a period like we've had over the past couple months, um, arbitrage was not really where you want it to be. Arb was a wonderful spot to be in until the end of November of last year. And the things that really worked in December, January, February were DeFi, um, some stat album RV, uh, mean reversion, um, a little bit of market making, but DeFi has kind of been the standout. And so I don't know how long that lasts for, but our goal kind of with this portfolio, which is still somewhat in construction, 
is to have a couple fingers in each of these pies and have this kind of excess spare capacity across the portfolio that allows us to, at a moment's notice, if we want to shift 30% of our book from ARB into market making or market making into RV or whatever it is um, and be able to move with the market. You just mentioned uh, mean reversion. By the way, we haven't spoken about mean reversion. I'd also, I wouldn't necessarily put that into the market neutral category, but that's just me. Dif no. You know, other people do it different ways. But, you know, to me, that is a, it can be a fairly risky left tail type of trading um, that, that you get with that. So anyway, what's um, interesting to me is when you say you're shifting the allocations depending on where you see the opportunity, you've mentioned as an example, cash and carry. If cash and carry were to come back, say in Bitcoin, to like 34%, even higher than 40% yields of what we've seen there, right? Then you'd be looking to do that trade, looking to scale up and, and really size that trade. Um, how do you do that? Do you have like one manager out of the pool of managers that run accounts for you and this manager a is doing cash and carry trading only this is my cash and carry manager this is my mm -hmm. recognition manager this is my stat art manager this is my basis trading manager and you you only trade the one month versus you know three months point of the bitcoin curve and then you kind of like you know take capital away from one and put it to the other or do you have managers that also run a larger set of strategies say you know, I were one of your managers, I'd say, oh, David, I have five strategies and I want to run all of them. And I want to be in charge of dialing them up and down, depending on what I see. So we might have conflicting views. Um, how, how do you go about that? Cash and carry is such a simple trade. Um, and like that we have run internally at Nickel for a number of years. Nickel also runs an arbitrage fund in which they've done cash and carry for, uh, I think, three years now. Um, we would just do that internally and not charge fees on it rather than hand it out to an external manager. But where we are handing, you know, trades out or outsourcing these trades to, to other managers that aren't ourselves, we have limits. For example, we would never put more than 20% of capital with a manager, with a single manager, because there is some operational risk because they're using their own trading system and if the trading system were to have an issue before we could intervene, there's all sorts of kind of edge cases that you want to protect against. So we do have various different risk limits across the kind of across the portfolio, but generally it's the first of, of the descriptions that you had, which is we're trying to find the very best manager or really the very best two managers, maybe three managers doing a particular trade. And then we can sit on top of that and manage the allocations across them to reflect what we think a perfect portfolio looks like. Got it. Another thing that I want to talk about is DeFi. Uh, you just mentioned the term. So in kind of like when you say you had these sub accounts or you have these sub accounts set up uh, at a centralized exchange, and maybe you're integrating, you've mentioned Clearloop, which is, you know, a copper product, you're integrating that as well. So you kind of like, you are in control of the tokens. You can see where they are and you know, you know what's hot and you know what's cold. Um, so that is from a risk management perspective, that is that is one kind of like category to look at. Now, when you go into DeFi, that view changes um, because you know, copper and you know, these type of things, well, they they don't really on you know on board there. You you're going on chain. So how do you how do you talk to your managers about you know, and, and what type of questions, tricky questions, um, you know, do you need to ask in order to be satisfied that they're actually, you know, that they know what they're doing, which is so different. I mean, you know what you're doing from a strategy point of view in the sense, oh yeah, I want to kind of like stake this, or I want to yield farm here. I want to, you know, you know, be part of MakerDAO, but uh, you need to get on that chain. You need to get off that chain. You know, you get, you get rewards. Um, you know, how do you, how frequently do you convert them? Uh, who's signing off on these transactions. This is such a different kind of like due diligence and questionnaire mm -hmm. type of exercise, which most investors have never really gone through. Uh, but those questions are so important because, you know, if you, you mess that up, there's a big accident. I think the questions are largely the same and the, the questions are completely different. Like uh, from an operational perspective, how you answer those questions is totally different in DeFi to CeFi or TradFi or whatever people might be used to. So on the custody piece, for example, 
Um, all of our assets are held with our custodian. Um, and we're like in, in, in our case, we use Copper, and Copper has a walled garden. And this allows us to move assets between our various exchange accounts without being able to remove assets from accounts in the fund's name. So we can't just withdraw crypto to our own accounts, for example. And Copper sort of sits in the middle of that relationship and enforces this. On the DeFi side of things, it looks very different. This is not like address whitelisting on exchanges um, with each other and creating this walled garden, but the effect is quite similar. Um, so one of the common kind of solutions to this, I say common, um, one of the solutions is you effectively create a multi-sig wallet where two signers are needed, you, the manager, and the custodian. And the custodian agrees to whitelist certain protocols that you're allowed to interact with. So for example, you might be allowed to interact with the Uniswap DAI USDC pool, which allows you to provide liquidity to the DAI USDC pool and collect trading fees from that, or exchange DAI for USDC or USDC for DAI in that pool. However, you can't trade a different Uniswap pool like DAI Bitcoin, and you can't go to a different DeFi protocol because those things are not whitelisted. So you have a similar kind of setup that's possible. It's a little bit more difficult. It's different in terms of how it's implemented, but the outcome is pretty much the same, which is like the custodian can limit where you can trade and what you can trade via a whitelist. And so it's taken a lot of work for us to get to where we are now with the custodian that we're happy with and um, literally putting whitelists in place at the moment, figuring out issues around pricing, um, and like how is the administrator going to independently value these assets at the end of the month, for example. Um, there's audit, there's regulatory concerns. There's lots of different pieces, I think, if you want to responsibly trade in DeFi that you need to work through. And to date, it's been somewhat of a break. I think up until December, um, DeFi was averagely attractive for us. And since you know December, January, February, were months in which it was much more attractive. But um, we, we were still in the process of putting all of this in place. Um, and we're kind of getting to the end of that now. And so I think DeFi exposure should start to ramp as we solve these questions. Um, but yeah, it, it's not easy. There's, it's a whole new world of market structure and questions and things to think about and ways of solving these kind of existing problems. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, simple things but very critical things like a permanent loss of keys i mean if sometimes you have like smaller type of trading operations and you know, we speak to them and it's kind of like there's one person signing off on a transaction that person has the key some of them have like you know dual signature and you know there's two people signing off on a transaction but you know god forbid something happened to them at the same point in time that key's gone if they don't have a backup uh, whatever type of backup plan that is, it could be a backup where you have the involvement of a custodian or a notary or some law, I, I don't know, audit law firm. There's different uh, ways to skin that cat, I think. But the answer of, well, it's unlikely that something's going to happen to both of us at the same time is not satisfactory because it can happen. And if that happens, then you've lost your investment. So this this just doesn't fly with anyone. Um, and this is this is so different because in traditional finance you have like if, if, if in a normal fund you know type of structure you have a custodian you know it's it's the custodian's job you know to look after the safekeeper you know, to do the safekeeping of the assets to make sure that they're there and that they're accessible and you know, these type of things it's all implemented for years and years and years and it's you know the, the processes run everybody knows them but you can still set them up in different ways in crypto land yeah but we have I mean we have DeFi custodians in crypto who have multiple layers of redundancy themselves, um, where you can be one of those redundant layers as well for them. And there are sort of, there are, there are companies that provide like a cost, backup custodian service as well, where if the custodian went under at the same time as you went under and all of the keys were lost irrevocably because the systems were wiped across multiple geographies by some... I don't know, nuclear attack, just some crazy scenario, you've still got somebody with a physical backup that they're storing in a safe somewhere that 
um, would allow you to reconstitute all of this and, and um, make, make investor assets kind of available again. But there are some very, very, very robust processes like this that exist today and which are like Lloyd's of London insured as well. So I think, and I, I don't know what the payout would be like on that, um, but I think just the fact that somebody is willing to insure these things says a little bit about giving, you know, giving the very low risk appetite among insurers for anything that's touching crypto. I think they would need to get exceedingly comfortable um, in order to underwrite yeah. something. Yes, and uh, you know, I spoke to Natalie about this a year, year and a half ago. Uh, you know, I have the my feeling is that the risk limits, um, like cyber insurance, digital asset type of insurance, of insurance and reinsurance firms, are slowly but surely increasing, so that you know, greater type of protections become available. My hunch is they're not necessarily cheap because all of this is still nascent, and uh, you know, it's a new market, so uh, you don't have as you know, you, you simply don't have the data points. It's no, it's it's very different. Like you know, insuring against some you know weather type of risk where you have like you know decades of weather rec weather records uh, that that you can draw from. Uh, in in our space, I mean, really, the clock started ticking. If you you know very early like Bitcoin Dash Monero Litecoin, but you know really kind of started ticking 2015 with you know more tokens becoming available and just the market becoming more active. I mean, this is. So it's six, seven years. It's it's really not much, even though it trades three sixty four, uh, three sixty five, twenty four seven. So you know we have many more data points in any given year than you would have for say lean hawks, um, you know which which only trades for a couple of hours during the day and definitely not not during the weekend, uh, but still statistically speaking, it's not that much. I remember trying to get directors and officers insurance in twenty nineteen. Um, yeah, it's meant it's usually a formality and the quotes we were getting were like seven to ten times uh, the normal premiums there you go so david yeah. before we wrap this up i mean this by the way has been fascinating but you know the last question is of course you know where do you see these markets going um if you if you're willing to share maybe you don't have an opinion um then that's fine as well but if you have one i'd be very happy to hear it so i i'd say in terms of kind of directionality i have uh some opinions that are weakly held. Um, I, I think if we kind of step back and, and try and think of the things that I feel that I know to be true, I think I know to be true that crypto as an architecture is fundamentally useful um, from a technology perspective. Um, I think somewhere between 10 and 20 years from now, you will see kind of crypto protocols being part of the standard web stack. And this is gonna be kind of open public infrastructure for the world in the same way as TCP IP is and SMTP is with email. Um, I, I think we'll sort of see this integration. And I think the next thing I know to be true, or I think I know to be true is that the tokens underlying these protocols are necessary to the functioning. And what that means is that necessarily we're gonna have large, truly deep markets for these tokens. And therefore we're gonna have a market. And if we have a market, um, there's going to be trading opportunities. There's going to be derivatives. I don't think what the developments that we've seen in crypto markets, the rise of derivatives, the fragmentation of that liquidity is going away. I think that continues to sort of increase. And with it, we will have more kind of heterogeneity in the market, which is to say more natural buyers and sellers of these assets that are doing more than just speculating. And as that happens, those flows should become tradable. Um, I think that crypto is global and new and fascinating and somewhat narrative driven and exciting and then because, and also very kind of early and speculative today, even in just like, is this technology going to work? And so when we piece all of that together, I think we have a market that continues to exist, continues to get larger and more liquid continues to be volatile um, as these narratives kind of buffer prices around um, and continues to be tradable. And so while the past kind of few months have been difficult for everyone trading in market neutral across the crypto space, it's been very, very quiet. Everyone's had a very good break. Everyone is ready to kind of get back to action. Um, this period feels a lot like the last six months of 2019, the second half of that year where we had a wonderful start to 2019, 
Um, we then had, it sort of culminated in June, Facebook announced uh, Libra and the kind of stablecoin project that they had. And that sort of marked a local top and markets imploded a little bit from there. And we had this very quiet summer that bled into a super quiet September, October, November, December. And market neutral just went quiet. And everybody was looking at cash and carry and saying, the basis trade is over. Um, you know, it's gone. The big boys are here. And it was fun while it lasted, but it's over. And what happened next was like things picked up in January of 2020. And we had a wonderful January and February of 2020. Um, in March, we had COVID and like the space sort of blew up and everything was crazy in every financial market. But things picked up in, in as early as April, really. And we had, you know, the DeFi summer over the summer of 2020, which was absolutely bananas. And really the period kind of January 2020 through to the end of May, specifically like the 19th of May 2021, which is 18 months, was a period of extraordinary trading conditions, which in 2019, no one really would have predicted. And I think... Since then, we've had a quiet, you know, we had a quiet June and July. Things picked up in September, October, November. We had a local kind of crash in December. And I think trading opportunities are multifactorial. Um, one of those factors is, yes, like there are more and more institutional players coming in and they are tightening markets up. But the big kind of modulator of these markets is retail. And if retail comes back in a big way, I think we will see high teens basis come back for example. I don't think that's gone forever. I think it's just harder to achieve and maintain. Um, and we will see more volumes. We'll see more volatility. I think over a long time horizon, my personal view is that crypto markets will go up. Over the medium and short term, I don't know. I don't know if we're in a bear market, not in a bear market, at the edge of a bull market or not. There, there are rare moments in time where I feel like you can bang your fist on the table and say, this is happening. And this is very much not one of those. Most people I've seen in this space have been kind of short term confused by crypto markets since August, at least. Everyone was, I think, expecting something different than what's happened over the past couple of quarters. And so I don't know. I, I'm optimistic on the space. I'm optimistic on the opportunity set for, for market neutral. Um, I think month to month, you don't know what happens, but everybody should, I think, have probably a good year. Well, we certainly hope so. I wish Thanks. you a very good year. Uh, all of us uh, trading crypto markets a very good year. Thank you, David. Um, I enjoyed that a lot. That was fascinating. And I hope that uh, viewers and listeners um, find it helpful as well. If you have any questions, um, David and I, uh, we're, you, know, you can contact us in the, I think, comment box of the video. Uh, or contact us on Twitter. I, we're, we're both on Twitter. Um, and I guess we'll be both helpful uh, or ready to help. So thank you, everyone. David, thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Hey there, visionaries. Your free membership to Real Vision Crypto, the world's premier source for cryptocurrency and digital asset analysis, is available right now at realvision.com forward slash crypto.